Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the budget address as delivered by the Honorable Member for Castries East and Prime Minister of St. Lucia under the theme Building Our Infrastructure for a Resilient Economy. Mr. Speaker, I request your leave briefly to once again take this opportunity to thank those who prayed for my speedy recovery. And it was really speedy. Even my doctor is flabbergasted. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, one of these days I will speak to the St. Lucian public about health, wellness, and illness. I want to thank my husband who accompanied, accompanied me on this very challenging journey um, to Martinique for medical treatment. I want to thank the Council General in Martinique. I want to thank the Honorable Prime Minister and my Cabinet colleagues. I want to thank the people of Babolo the people of St. Lucia and in the diaspora for their prayers, encouragement, and support. Moi, je vous remercie tout le monde qui supporte moi, les motés malades là. Et avec moi, je vous remercie ma oui, moi, qui était partie avec moi aller à Martinique. Moi, je vous remercie Council General Martinique. Et puis, moi, je vous remercie Premier ministre. Et puis c'est même cabinet comme on a dit en gouvernement. Moi, je veux remercier tout Jean Babodo. Nous avons commencé à débarrer. Bodis, La Guerre, Monsito, Plateau, Pébouche, Gara, Babodo Central, Tichime, Fonasso, Chassé, Salvan, Kako Jiwa, Hill 20, Kabish, Balata. Simon and Union Terrace. Mr. Speaker, there is one phrase that I love when I address a gathering, Mr. Speaker. And it reads, I shall pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness I can show to any fellow human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer. Defer it, nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Romans 25 to 26, quoted by Stephen Gallet, 1773 to 1855, a French-American Quaker missionary. I love this because, Mr. Speaker, I believe that what we have to do, when we are given an opportunity to do it, we better do it. Do not defer it or postpone and say we'll do it later. We may never get that chance. Mr. Speaker, I want to turn quickly to the business at hand. And that business is the budget presentation presented by the Honorable Member for Castries East and Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, this is a pregnant budget and it will deliver many healthy babies in the coming months. The reviews have been overwhelming with positive vibes. That is what I'm getting from the St. Lucian populace. In the same vein, Mr. Speaker, we have seen those in, on the other side who do not want to see St. Lucia succeed. They will go all out to destroy the good name of our country and paint St. Lucia in a negative light. Mr. Speaker, 
We are not here for that. We are there to promote positive vibes. And this is what this budget is about. Mr. Speaker, as Minister with Responsibility for the Public Service, Home Affairs, Labor and Gender Affairs, it is my duty in this House to expand on the presentation made by the Honorable Member for Castries East and Prime Minister of St. Lucia on the state of affairs under my watch. Mr. Speaker, I will speak in the same order as the departments are assigned to the permanent secretaries in my ministry. First, I will speak to the departments of public service, labor, gender affairs, and then to the department of home affairs. I will touch briefly on what was achieved in the last financial year and what we propose to undertake in this financial year, 2024-2025. But before I go into the debate, Mr. Speaker, I want to make no apology for supporting the Honorable Prime Minister, member for Castries East, an astute leader, a man of his word. And I give my full support to the Prime Minister who chose not to sign the MOA on the CIP as was requested of the OEC estates. And he did that, Mr. Speaker, in the interest of St. Lucia. And we keep the mantra, putting you first. And he knows what he promised the people of St. Lucia, and therefore he kept his promise, Mr. Speaker. This budget, Mr. Speaker, which I describe as an impregnated budget, has something for everybody for pensioners, for youth, girls, boys, professionals, farmers, business, persons in tourism, IT, just name it. Mr. Speaker, we need to look beyond those who preach hate and division and show goodwill to each other for prosperity in this country. This government comprises of a team. We have a team leader. And in that team, if you touch one, you touch all. It's not just the noise, Mr. Speaker. It's about remaining cool, remaining calm, and be very decisive in the actions that we take so that we can achieve the goals and the aspirations of the St. Lucian people. Mr. Speaker, to condense 365 days of work by thousands of persons in one hour is a huge task. However, I will focus on some of the most critical areas. And I start with the Department of the Public Service. This department has the following units public sector modernization, human resource management and development, organizational development, facilities management, training, security, and employee assistance program. This department serves as the clearing house for all government services in these areas. It is the hub in the middle of the wheel. This hub has to be sufficiently oiled to facilitate the smooth operations of government. During the last financial year, we were able to implement a number of programs to ensure that the government functions in a manner that has resulted in the growth that we, that was highlighted in this budget and by the member for Cass Resist. Because without proper management, 
without workers producing and become productive, if they are not efficient, if they are not effective, we will not see growth in our economy. We will not see development in our society. We will not see a reduction in crime. We will not see an advancement in education, improvement in health. Our people, the human resource capacity, is what we have to focus on. Mr. Speaker, the government of St. Lucia recognizes the power of digital transformation as a catalyst and main strategic policy in its efforts to eradicate poverty, promote digital inclusion, and enhance human resource capacity in its effort to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. This process started from 2013 until under this government, and now we have seen the need to refresh the strategy to ensure that it is in keeping with digital trends and the government of St. Lucia's development agenda. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Public Sector Modernization recorded many achievements in the last financial year in the areas where a number of government departments have started getting used to the technology to improve the quality of service they deliver to the public in a digital St. Lucia. And it is not an easy task, Mr. Speaker, because when some persons are not used to the technology, you find quite a bit of resistance. We need some legislative reform to make some of the digital practices in accordance with our laws. We need to enact the Digital Government Governance Bill, which is in draft form now. Digital Government DigiGov platform, for example, within transport, has provided 32 services which have led the way in, the, in modernizing government's digital government through the delivery of online service, training, and the development of new capabilities and skills. In 2023 to 2024, Mr. Speaker, a total of 77,183 persons have submitted application in the transport department. There are 21,519 registered users of DigiGov. Civil status registry services where they deal with application for birth and death certificates online during 2023 to 2024, we, we noticed 11,925 applications given. Registry of Companies and Intellectual Property, ROSIP, from February, 47 law firms have registered. A total of 344 companies have submitted, uh, their applications have been approved. In the coming period, phase six and seven of the project will deal with the following agencies. Commerce will be dealing with liquor and trade license, import duty concessions, consumer complaints, incentives, labor work permit, citizenship application. In the Attorney General's chambers, we'll deal with new marriage license. Civil status registry of birth and death and police trafficking. And police traffic ticketing. We have the GI Net project. Islandwide, Mr. Speaker. Islandwide installation completed in Grosile, Lafay Mothers and Fathers Hall, Labon Human Resource Center, Deramo Community Center, Grosile Human Resource Center, Pigeon Island, Rivier Mitan. Then we have Babodo Community Center, Fonasso, Garan, Lage. 
In Anslawe, we have in Anslawe, we have in Canaries, Shosel playing field, Miku South, Miku North, Castri Central, Castri South, Denry North, Denry South, Viewfort South, Castri South, Viewfort North. In this financial year, phase three will cover additional areas in Babolo, Grosile, Castri South, Castri North, Castri Central, Miku South, Viewfort North, Ancillary, Chosel, and Labry. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> in the Department of Public Service, we have facilities management. Repairs to the Graham Luisi Administrative Building. We are going to work on the stairs, improve security system, shared services department in the Southern Division to facilitate expansion of government services in the south of the island. This initiative will provide a one-stop solution to the various government services by eliminating the need to visit government offices in the north of the island. And Mr. Speaker, that has been a challenge. It has been troubled. And this is something that in this financial year, the government is going to give serious attention in providing a lot more services to the persons living in the southern part of the island. The Graham Lucy building, Mr. Speaker, you are very familiar with it. If you notice, there is an entrance to the building, and this building is the building that housed the Prime Minister and other governments. We have cabinet room, and all government ministers visit that building on a regular basis. But if you notice, Mr. Speaker, when you enter that building, there are no serious security measures. And this is something that we are going to pay close attention to. And there will be a retrofitting of the front of the building in order to ensure that there are security screening for persons entering that building. Mr. Speaker, the Public Service Department, Future and Projections. The Department of the Public Service is currently preparing a strategic plan to guide the transformation of government's operations. As I indicated earlier, the Department of the Public Service is critical for the efficient and effective functioning of government. And in the strategic plan, which is still in draft form, we look at the vision for the public service. And this vision speaks to a proactive an achievement force focus department devoted to driving innovation in managing and providing exceptional public services. The mission, the mission is to deliver exceptional, equitable and efficient services by fostering inclusivity, transparency, accountability and sustainability while enhancing employee well-being through the institutional strengthening, through institutional strengthening, innovation, and human resource management. Mr. Speaker, to achieve this, the government of St. Lucia is facing a period of radical change at the global, regional, and national levels. The public sector mechanisms Dealing with preparing the people, systems, and processes must now be realigned and modernized to lead the change. The government has therefore embarked on a major exercise to develop a five-year strategic plan for the period 2024 to 2028 for the Department of the Public Service, Gender Affairs, and Labor, along with the strategic plan, there will be an operations manual and a results management process. With these plans, we need an improved working environment to bring most of the units in the Department of Public Service under one roof, to develop a new culture to function in a more efficient manner. Therefore, 
The proposed plan is to relocate the Public Service Department to the Orange Grove Plaza. We need to replace the staff orders which has been in existence for over 40 years. We will do this by enacting the new Public Sector Modernization Bill of 2024 to realize the goals of the strategic plan. Mr. Speaker, we cannot achieve new things with old ideas. The new brand of the Public Service Management and Administrative Department is expected to give new direction to the rest of the public service, ministries, and agencies. This government will do what is required to retain public officers, improve its recruitment process, and introduce key performance indicators to derive value for money and improve performance of public officers. And Mr. Speaker, by way of statistics, government has to raise approximately $43 million to meet its wages obligation in this country. And therefore, we have to ensure that our officers are giving us value for money. Government under its wages has up to close to 14,000 persons. Government is the largest and single employer in this country. Mr. Speaker, I move quickly to gender affairs. The department has made significant strides in recent times. They have just moved into a new location, whereby this location, the last accommodation was insufficient for current staff. We were on the, on, under the umbrella of innovation, and the innovation wanted to engage in a little more innovative activities, so we were a little constraining the space. So we had to get out. So now we have found a new home for the Department of Gender Affairs. This division of Gender Affairs benefits from regional projects on behalf of the government of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, valued collectively at over four million US dollars. These are monies that come to St. Lucia as grants. These are not loans. These are monies they give for the department to work on gender equality programs. Mr. Speaker, we have project officers who have been recruited to ease the burden for implementation on the already inadequate staff of the department. The new office space identified can accommodate all members of staff and the project officers for two projects. The office is also sufficient to accommodate new staff complement proposed in the new structure for the division beyond the life of the projects. Mr. Speaker, that space includes two notable new features and services. One, an office for a civil society organization in coordination for women's empowerment for over three decades. The National Council of Voluntary Women's Organization. This gesture coincides with the start of the review of the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action 30 years after implementation in 2025. Mr. Speaker, your humble servant was in Beijing 29 years ago when this document was designed to advance gender equality. I was heading the St. Lucia delegation at the time. Then we also have case management for various forms of gender-based violence and provisions of essential services for gender-based violence. The Build Back Equal project has closed application for a case manager for St. Lucia. A gender-based violence case manager will be assigned to St. Lucia in the coming weeks. Mr. Speaker, I know you are fully aware that um, this year we have established a women's parliamentary caucus under the chairmanship or chairwomanship of the Honorable President of the Senate. And 
This morning we had uh, the president of the Seawheel chapter for St. Lucia, Karen Tobia, who was here with us in the house. I want to commend persons like Catherine Seeley. Raise your voice. These persons have been championing the issues of gender equality in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the provisions made by this government under the leadership of the member for Castries East is a true reflection of this government's commitment to achieving gender equality in the country. Not like those who only give lip service to the issue of gender. When the honorable men and women in cabinet can agree to remove a 12.5% VAT on sanitary napkins, what more would you like to hear, Mr. Speaker? And mostly men eh, who are there. And if you look at the Prime Minister's budget address on page 9, number 31, he speaks to the reduction of VAT or the removal of VAT on sanitary napkins. That is a big thing for the women, especially the youth. The Department of Gender, Mr. Speaker, is one department which has been generating the necessary resources for most of its activities and programs. The department has received financial support from UN Women, the French government through the French embassy here, and the Canadian government. I need to applaud the Prime Minister and the member for Castries East and his cabinet of ministers for the high level of gender sensitivity in all the programs. I must admit, Mr. Speaker, that the passage of the Domestic Violence Act, number 11 of 2022, has certainly put St. Lucia at a very high level that earned its greatest respect at the local, regional, and international levels among promoters of gender equality. I need to report that St. Lucia is seen in very high regard in that area. Mr. Speaker, arrangements were made for a reallocation to purchase a vehicle in this financial year. The Domestic Violence Act of number 11 of 2022 places the responsibility to provide transportation for victims on the minister with responsibility for gender affairs. A new vehicle will serve a dual function of transporting survivors of gender-based violence for case management services which needed, when needed, and assist with outreach exercises both for gender mainstreaming and gender-based violence prevention. We have professional consultancy on gender-based legislation. The Gender Department is currently conducting an evaluation to determine the status of the Women's Support Center. This center has been in existence, but its status has not been defined as to whether it is a government agency, an NGO, or whatever. And now we are actually looking at how do we define the status, because they are getting a subvention from government, and there are other responsibilities that the government is asked to undertake. So now we are actually investigating to find out what is the status of that entity. The report is, which is the, 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 the study which is ongoing is expected to be completed in the next two months. Mr. Speaker, I move quickly to the Department of Labor, which is under the public service, the PS of public service, labor and gender affairs, Mr. Speaker. With regards to labor, on Wednesday next week, it will be Labor Day, Labor Day celebrations. Everyone is invited and reminded that May 1st, 2024, is Labor Day. It's a holiday, and the day is for workers. The Department of Labor, in collaboration with the Trade Union Federation, have planned activities for the week and Labor Day itself, the activity itself for the day. There will be a rally at Serenity Park for all workers in St. Lucia. The employers, government officials, 
and the trade union leaders who will gather to address you starting from 10 a.m. in the morning. This is a day set aside for workers to reflect, celebrate, and relax. The occasion will start with a solidarity march, and addresses will be given by the Prime Minister, Minister of Labor, representatives from the employers and the trade unions. There will be entertainment from after the speeches by some of our popular entertainers and Calypsonians. In the Department of Labor, during last year, Mr. Speaker, we had well over 10 employees of the department who pursued training in areas related to labor and employment relations. There was an increase in the number of occupational safety and health inspections and accident reports from a total of about 250 cases to over 500 cases in 2023. Mr. Speaker, there was the signing of 40 collective agreements in 2023, settlement of a number of industrial disputes, including WASCO and CSA, Lucilec and CSA, Banker St. Lucia and NWU, Henneken St. Lucia and NWU, Riesling Solutions and NWU. Workers continue towards the introduction of domestic employment. Work continues towards the introduction of domestic employment where potential employees will be able to apply for local jobs through the labor department. To this end, I have engaged the director of the youth economy in a discussion to allow the department of labor to utilize the apps that they have developed that will enable us to register and process applicants in quick time. In the coming months, Mr. Speaker, if you um, follow the presentation from the member for Castries East and Prime Minister on the number of projects that are coming on stream in St. Lucia, we will have a serious challenge with labor and skills workers in St. Lucia. And for that matter, the Department of Work Permit will have a heavy task in order to address persons who may come. We have CSME, and we have persons who are coming outside of St. Lucia to work. And we also have to protect our St. Lucian persons to ensure that they are given priority where they have the necessary skills for the job. Mr. Speaker, Increase in presentations on the Labor Act. We have been engaged in a number of activities to educate and enlighten persons on the Labor Act. There was a deliberate effort by the department to help increase sensitization of more people to the contents of the Labor Act. The Viewfort Office, with the assistance of the Labor Commissioner, was able to make 10 of the 14 presentations that it was asked to do within the month of March. Appearances by the Labor Commissioner and some other senior officers on Labor Day and other related issues on radio and television stations. This week is Labor Day week, and there are quite a few activities going on in the, in the country. Mr. Speaker, as we look at some new initiatives for 2024-25, for over three years now, St. Lucia has failed to live up to its obligations in terms of reporting on ILO conventions. We now have two officers who receive special training in that area. And so, as early as this month of May 2024, we expect to commence the reporting on these conventions. We have engaged ILO in assisting us with the ratification of six ILO conventions for 2024. These conventions are Convention 138, dealing with minimum wage, 144, tripartite, 184, occupational safety and health in agriculture, 187, promotional framework of occupational safety and health, 189, domestic workers, 
and 190 violence and harassment convention and the unions are very strong on um, the government having to um, ratify convention 190 which deals with violence and harassment in the workplace. The Trade Union Federation has written and they articulated that again this week that they are not backing down on this one. They want the government to move in the direction. So this is one of them that are included for discussion and ratification. We have secured training for labor officers in the areas of conciliation, mediation, and industrial relations with Cipriani College in Trinidad and Tobago. Advertising some positions at the labor department in the coming months, that will be done because we have some vacancies there. And these positions include assistant labor commissioner, occupational safety and health officer, statistical officer, and clerk among others. The Department of Labor, in consultation with the Ministry of Tourism and other key stakeholders, took a position where regional and international artists performing at the Jazz Festival 2024, I know Minister of Tourism will be happy about that, and beyond will not be required to complete individual work permit application forms. They have defined a system that will expedite the process. Instead, the information is provided on a spreadsheet for groups of individual, individuals helping to expedite the process and to enhance the ease of doing business. Um, Minister of Commerce would like to hear we are doing ease of doing business. <laughs> The government of Canada is embarking on a new foreign labor program for agriculture. Fishing and seafood processing and sea f um, for agriculture, fishing and sea processing. This new program will allow workers on completion of one contract to move to another employer on another contract without having to apply for a new work permit. That's a new arrangement. Before, when they serve a one contract, contract is like they have to start the whole process again for another employer. The exercise will involve a gradual approach and will be done in a phase basis commencing in 2025, with full completion due by 2027. Mr. Speaker, in the Social and Economic Review of 2023, Page 50, we have um, in that report and in the budget address on page 15, page 11, we have the issue of the labor force. And here we notice that the labor force unemployment, labor force expanded all-time high. It was, there was an expen uh, expansion in the labor force, increase. High employment recorded for both genders. Here, Mr. Speaker, we saw male 8.5% increase, which amounted to 54,387 persons. And female employment increased by 4.5% which is 43,007 persons. Now, Mr. Speaker, when we talk of unemployment, one of the areas that we have seen as a challenge, and even in the budget um, presentation, you would have noticed a number of projects coming on stream. And most of these projects require men in the construction industry. And this is an area that the Department of Gender Affairs has started some discussion and we are looking at areas where we are willing to train, getting ready to train some women to go into the construction industry. And this is something that we have a lot of women who stay home and these, because now with technology and, and, and heavy duty equipment, it's not like before you needed the strength to lift up heavy things. You can be involved in the, we have so many engineers in the Department of Infrastructure who are women. So we have to open the doors. 
rather than saying we do not have enough skilled workers, we have to import persons to come and work, and then we have the women at home doing very little, and therefore, and they are not going into the areas where they have the heavy pay. Women are usually in the areas where they have low pay. And the unemployed persons, um, when I say I have, um, how we call it, we have SEP. If you look at the number of persons who are the majority of them are women. These are people who could be bricklayers, they could be electrician, they could be um, um, putting on tires, they can do painting, they can do plumbing. This does not require heavy lifting and therefore we need to open that door so we have more persons involved in the job bucket. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a request was made to purchase another set of equipment to help assess the air quality in workplaces. And I need to report, Mr. Speaker, that the, the Civil Service Association um, wrote to the government indicating that they are willing to sit around the table so that we look at the issue of mold and air quality in the workplace because that has been costing the government a fortune to do air quality tests and treating mold. And they said if we have that dialogue between the unions and government, we can look at what are the best ways of handling and preventing these um, hazards in the workplace. Mr. Speaker, as mentioned on page 68 in the budget, the Minister of Finance made reference to the minimum wage. We established a minimum wage commission which has submitted a report to the cabinet of ministers for consideration and the member for Castries East and Prime Minister has indicated that by August 1st, the government will announce a minimum wage for St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, we have the Labor Tribunal. The Labor Tribunal is playing a very significant role in ensuring that we have industrial peace in the country. However, they have a challenge in getting a suitable place to operate, Mr. Speaker, to conduct their activities, to ensure that there is justice in the cases involving employer and employee disputes. The number of cases are growing. There were many cases which emerged, especially during the time of COVID-19 when many workers felt they were taken advantage of by some employers. The government is actively working with the tribunal to settle on an appropriate place to function. And the tribunal is like a court case and they need a place that where there is confidentiality, uh, not much disruption, and the Department of Labor does not have adequate space for them to operate. So they have been all over the place trying to get venues to have their meetings and we have to work on that to give them the support. I need to thank the members of the Labor Tribunal for their patience and understanding. As Minister with Responsibility for Labor, I have been meeting the trade unions to discuss the implementation of their collective agreement and issues dealing with re um, conciliation because all these are necessary to ensure that we have dialogue between government and the trade unions or employer and employee to minimize um, conflicts and to avoid industrial disputes. Mr. Speaker, as you know right now as we speak, we are in the negotiations mode. The government has set up a negotiating team to discuss with the unions the new areas for conditions of service. The discussions have started and it is the hope of the Prime Minister that this process will end shortly so he can focus on the many other matters which impact national development. Mr. Speaker, I move quickly now to the other branch on the, another permanent secretary which is Home Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Home Remember Affairs... Remember, you have 15 minutes left. Huh? You have 15 minutes left. 15 minutes left. Okay. The depart Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Department of Home Affairs comprise the following units. Fire service, bodily, correctional facility, citizens, probation and parole, youth justice. At 
present, there is the creation of the Department of National Security and the transfer of national security programs and the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, the Marine Unit and Immigration from the Department of Home Affairs. During the last two years and eight months, the administration of the police was under the Home Affairs. Now that we have a separation, not a divorce, I have not seen the divorce paper, so it's a separation. <laughs> A separation, it is important to note that the issue of national security is not the responsibility of just the police, as was stated by the Minister with Responsibility for Crime and Persons with Disability. National security is the responsibility of every citizen in this country, and each and every one of us has to play a role to work with the police to keep our country safe and secure. Mr. Speaker, it is important that I draw your attention to what we have achieved in the Department of Home Affairs. The department has reached a point where we have managed to define the role of the department as the protective services. This government is mandated to protect our citizens and keep them safe. The police must continue to work closely with all the other protective units as a united force against crime and antisocial behavior. Mr. Speaker, I was able to visit all, I will not say what the except was, all except two police stations to see the conditions in which our law enforcement officers worked. In discussion at our heads of department meeting up to last week, Mr. Speaker, it was admitted by the heads of department that this is the first time in a very, very long time the government has invested so much in the protective services. None was left behind. Bordele got more than its fair share. The fire service, which had been almost forgotten, got their fair share. The police that always gets more, and others, although they find it sometimes still inadequate, all these units have confirmed that they are very pleased with the level of investment the government has made so far in improving their conditions of service. I think they deserve, we deserve a, a, a pat in the back, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, commission, the government commissioned a study to develop a new qualification benchmark for the protective services. This document has been submitted to the Prime Minister for further consideration and possible implementation. The rationale for this study was to create a distinction between the protective services and the rest of the public service in determining the requirements for promotion in the respective um, units. It also includes training plans and succession planning protocols. This indicates a focus on improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the protective services. Mr. Speaker, the policy includes the need for regular evaluation and upgrading of benchmarks and training programs to ensure they align with evolving threats and best practices. Establishment of succession planning protocols to develop a proactive approach to ensuring continuity and leadership within the protective services. Hence, it is vital to institutionalize sessions, succession planning across all levels of the protective services and the public service to mitigate leadership vac vacuums and maintain operational readiness. Citizenship, the implementation of the second generation citizenship, this suggests a policy shift allowing the grandchildren of St. Lucian born citizens to become eligible to apply for citizen by descent. Legislative amendments review and amend the Citizenship of St. Lucia Act to strengthen citizenship policies with national security considerations, ensuring thorough vetting processes 
while promoting inclusivity and diversity. Also, the inclusion of provisions for the residency in citizenship of St. Lucia Act and make the necessary amendments to the Immigration Act with regards to residency in St. Lucia. As you know, Mr. Speaker, I mentioned that the fire service got more than its fair share. The Borderly Correctional Facility have said that they have gotten a lot for years, over 20 years, they have never seen such a heavy investment in these areas. We have established the youth justice, recognizing the unique needs and challenges faced by youth involved in the justice system. It is imperative to address the delivery of services to youth at risk and those engaged in criminal activities. Mr. Speaker, as I move quickly to, to, the, um, to my constituency, I just want to remind the people in Babono, and I want to reiterate that the Lord said to his disciples, O ye of little faith, that they have to believe in the government, they have to believe in me, they have to believe in the ministers of government. Because this is one of the best governments that they have seen in their entire life. I make no apologies for that. We have a prime minister, a man of his word. And that's why you must not give him a gun. <laughs> because he'll use it. <laughs> so he uses his pen. No, no, he'll never use a gun because he's a man of his word. They said the worst thing is to tell somebody I need a gun to protect myself. The moment he gets into trouble, he remembers the gun. So when you have no gun, you don't think of it. All right? So he is a man of his word, and he has some very good pens that he used. That's his weapon. <laughs> his weapon is his pen. He makes sure the pen is not short of ink, so he can sign whatever he has to sign. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, as I said, we look at all the goodies that are there, and I'm very confident so far, I've been hearing from the different ministers, that the people of Babono will benefit from this budget. Um, Father Albert said he is not a copycat, the famous Father Albert, he said he is not a copycat. He's a train setter. And he used that to highlight that the Babono Choir will be on main stage jazz this year. And the Ministry of Tourism has afforded him. That's the only religious groups, only religious group in St. Lucia that will be on main stage jazz. That's Father Albert's group. Um, he said he's a train setter. And um, I have heard from the Minister of Agriculture, so I know my Maki farmers and those in Fawasa will be smiling. Uh, they will get support with the drainage. I will be listening to the Minister of Tourism. I know he has some good things coming for Babolo. The Minister of Health will be coming with something. The Minister of Housing and Local Government. Are you not smiling? <laughs> The Minister of Youth Development and Sports. The Minister of Infrastructure, he has started. So I know he'll continue along with for everybody. And I remain confident that we will deliver what we have promised the people. Um, so far, in the constituency, it is well structured, it is well organized. And I have been engaging the people and they are part of the discussion, they are part of the decision making, so they know exactly what will happen in their communities and in their constituency. Babolo Central is where we will be making the major transformation and we have identified 12 communities where there will be some signature projects. 
These signature projects were identified by the persons and we have already started some of them and we are waiting for backup from the respective ministries. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Ambassador for China, Taiwan, His Excellency Peter Chen, and the Ambassador for Venezuela and Cuba for their participation and support in every function that I have invited them to, whether it's through the ministry or the constituency. And I want to thank them for the government's support for St. Lucia on the whole. Mr. Speaker, I have told the constituents to be patient and as they can see from this budget, the Prime Minister will deliver and we will work with him to deliver what he has promised the people of St. Lucia. We have persons in my constituency, Mr. Speaker, no matter what you do, they will not be happy. No matter what you give them, they will not be happy. But we still have to work with them. And whatever we have, we pass it over to them. And I have been using the spraying can. And whatever water that I get from the Prime Minister, I go ahead and I spray it all over the place. So every single community has benefited from the water that the Prime Minister has given me. So Debara has seen activities going on. Bogis has seen activities. Lage. Plateau, Paybush, Gara, Babono Central gets the lion's share, Foasso, Talvan, Chasse, Tishime, Kako, just name it. I am all over, and you will see my footprints all over the constituency. It's not big, but it reaches the ordinary man. It reaches the ordinary woman, and we help in education. We help in health, we provide food, we create employment, and we create the little contracts, and I'm very happy that the little contracts are helping a lot of the women, the single mothers, they benefit from that to take care of the children. We bury some who have passed. Whatever we have to do, we share it. Mr. Speaker, I want to wish one of my challenging supporter, Mr. Angus Flora, his birthday in advance. He's coming with a big birthday. You won 200,000. I'm wishing him a happy birthday in advance. I'm wishing all my persons in Babodo, all those who prayed for me on my difficult journey, those who are with me, and those who are supporting me, and those who are coming towards me. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the young men and women. There are some young boys in Talvan. They are passionate about this government. And I want to ensure that we take very good care of them. They stand firm for decades for this government. I want to thank the staff of the Public Service, Home Affairs, Labor and Gender Affairs, for their support and their work and keeping the government afloat. I want to thank my colleague ministers for their support so far and in advance for what is to come. I want to thank the Prime Minister for having the courage, the fortitude, the strength to deliver this powerful message to the St. Lucian people. And I am hearing the buzz around, I don't know if you have your heads to the ground, but people are talking about this budget. And I don't know, because I was asking whether I should oppose the budget for us to have a debate, because I'm yet to debate the budget. The budget is so good that it does not have opposition. So let us go with what is in it 
for our people. Let us stay together as a Remember team. You need to start wrapping up. Yeah? You need to start wrapping up. Yes, and that's for you, Mr. Speaker, the wrap up. Let us stay together as a team with our able and competent captain, Honorable Member for Castries East and Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my wrap-up time, one minute, is for you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your determination, perseverance, resilience, and commitment to national service and love for your country, patience and tolerance for giving me and my colleagues a listening ear. I pledge my full support, Mr. Speaker, for the 2024-25 budget as delivered by our competent captain, the Honorable Prime Minister and Member for Castries East. Mr. Speaker, I applaud you for your courage, your strength, your tenacity, and your determination to see this government succeed. I thank you.